thanks everyone for joining. So we'll start these sessions with a uh, presentation from one of the founders and head of product with us, um, which will then follow with a Q&A session towards the end. Any questions you ask in the chat, I will collate them and uh, we can put them in towards the end if it is something you think is more relevant to be asked at the time that Hamnu is presenting it, then uh, mention it in your message and uh, we'll try and find a way to, to work it in. So um, yeah, Hamnu will be presenting on the next steps for Ivan. I guess probably most people are sick of hearing about what is happening right now around the world. So uh, let's uh, focus on roadmap new services that Ivan uh, plans to be offering um, and how they can help and fit in with your workflow. So I'll pass it over to Hanu and mute myself. Yeah, uh, thanks Chris for the intro. Uh, so my name is Hanu Alderman. I lead the product side of things at Ivan. I'm also one of the co-founders of the firm. Uh, so this is the, our first cloud chat. Um, today I'll be speaking about uh, our forthcoming uh, new re releases uh, around M3, Flink, and ClickHouse. Uh, if you have any questions, please send them Chris's way, and he'll try to uh, uh, basically ask them out loud at some point. So um, as an intro, uh, Ivan is a company that offers database as a service and messaging services in Five different public clouds. We offer eight different open source uh, databases slash messaging services in 90 something uh, cloud regions uh, around the world. Our customers range from small mom and pop aquarium stores to uh, large corporations like Toyota and Comcast. Uh, today, I'll be mostly focusing on the, um, the service that are forthcoming and the things, and not so much on the things that are currently already being offered. Um, the forward to the whole thing, as in how do we pick new services, as in uh, typically we have a set of criteria where we start plan when we start planning for new service that might be good additions to our portfolio. One of the uh, things that is that it absolutely has to be open source, as in we are great believers in open source and heavily contribute towards different open source projects. And it basically allows us to do fixes or feature additions to all these uh, services that we're going to be talking about. One of the other things is obviously that it needs to be technically excellent, not just merely uh, okay or good enough, but actually technical excellence needs to be shown one way or another. It's also uh, uh, required that it actually provide some new uh, capabilities that we didn't have before in our portfolio. And the other thing around the project itself, that it really uh, should have a strong community uh, with a future lookout uh, that actually um, sees that the project is going places. Uh, then, obviously, as we are a company, we are also looking for customer demand for these solutions. So that's one of the validation criteria we use. But furthermore, one of the other things is that we'd actually like to use these services ourselves, as in most of Ivan services are actually also being consumed uh, within Ivan to actually produce the Ivan service in question. So uh, we basically do this, this sort of dog fooding from day one. Uh, why do we need analytics databases? It's basically because um, a lot of our customers have huge data volumes that they would like to do analytics on. So the reason uh, why we're looking at this is uh, Avon already provides multiple relational databases like MySQL and Postgres, which work really well for online transaction processing, but they don't really work that well when uh, we start talking in the tens of terabytes data sets uh, that actually would need to be uh, uh, analyzed in short order. Uh, Typically, while you can actually put uh, enormous data volumes in uh, Postgres, for example, even on a single node, there are uh, reports of more than 50 terabyte Postgres instances in the wild. It really starts breaking down around the management of it and also around the tooling of it. Um, it's a, if that machine were to be lost, your recovery time would be probably pretty excessive. Uh, the other thing around these analytics databases, uh, why they are slightly different sort of beast than the relational database we offer is that typically, uh, because they're analytics uh, focused, 
they're not really about editing the data in place like you do in online transaction processing. But instead, the data is mostly uh, immutable once it actually enters the system. Um, the reason why we also started looking at this is that many of our customers have used services like Redshift, Snowflake, or Google BigQuery to actually do data analytics uh, that basically has as the source of truth a database that resides uh, with uh, as, as an Ivan service. But then basically they are collecting uh, data from that database and others uh, and basically just collate it together uh, and then run analytics uh, on it from, let's say, Redshift. Uh, all of these uh, come with their own limitations, as in uh, some may have bigger limitations than others, but the, they all are basically working uh, on analytics, more or less. Uh, uh, of course, if it becomes a part of our portfolio, we uh, do want it to actually integrate well with our, all of our existing services. And since a very large amount of companies are using our Kafka service to actually ingest data in a firehose-like manner to their data warehouses, uh, we thought that Kafka, uh, uh, like good support for Kafka, would be a like he, like strict requirement on this one. Also, uh, some of these things um, uh, work better on a contemporary hardware, as in are able to take uh, advantage of multiple CPUs and that sort of thing natively. Also, uh, uh, it's something that not historically all data warehouses have perhaps uh, been excellent at. So uh, without further ado, we're considering releasing uh, Aven for ClickHouse as one of the services this year. So uh, forward about ClickHouse itself. Uh, ClickHouse is a column-oriented database uh, that also supports horizontal, like horizontal and vertical scaling. So you can have uh, put it on very large uh, individual machines, but you can also scale it out horizontally to multiple different nodes. Uh, originally, uh, it was created by Yandex, who are still the uh, major force behind the project. Uh, but today, the largest uh, deployments of ClickHouse are actually uh, reside outside Yandex already. Uh, there's uh, thousands of companies already using uh, ClickHouse, uh, so basically, this is uh, ClickHouse has started to gain fame uh, quite a bit and uh, different uses already for years. So it's a fairly logical uh, extension of our portfolio. Uh, one of the tricks of how it actually performs so well is that it has extensive support for compression of different forms. So it supports things from uh, Gorilla uh, compression, which is very useful for time series data, to things like uh, uh, Facebook's ZSTD uh, algorithm uh, for compressing uh, data. Uh, there are multiple uh, different use cases that you can use it for. Uh, people can do uh, general purpose analytical uh, queries that uh, they have been doing uh, from time to time. But also people are actually using it also as a time series sort of database. Uh, some companies are using it for full text search like Uber, for example. Uh, but it has varied use cases around it. Uh, one of the other nice things about ClickHouse is that it actually supports data ingestion from Apache Kafka. So you can actually tell uh, ClickHouse that, could you please read this topic from Kafka uh, so, uh, and ingest all the data from there into this uh, data warehouse table that I'm running on top of ClickHouse cluster. Uh, it has been proven that it actually works on enormous data sets in the petabytes range. So uh, instead of talking about, let's say, double digits in terabytes, which are probably still doable uh, with our Postgres offerings on custom plans, we're now talking about multiple orders of magnitude more data that can be handled with something like this. Uh, the other thing uh, that around ClickHouse is that uh, it's not merely quick for some use cases. There are lots and lots of optimizations around different use cases there, uh, which basically makes it lightning fast for many queries. And of course, uh, as it's a common oriented database, it's actually uh, meant for mostly structured data. So this is probably not the place where which you want to use as a data lake for unstructured data, but this is a mere uh, like allows you to do analytical queries on data that has at least some sort of structure. Um, the way we'll be offering this is uh, uh, we'll initially be offering this from uh, one node up to n node clusters. Uh, of course, like all Ivan services, uh, we will be supporting uh, with no downtime upgrades to larger con configurations and obviously downgrades as well. But uh, 
it will basically be, um, be coming a, sta a standard out of the box. Uh, we'll obviously have other uh, regular things like uh, automatic backups of your data. And we will definitely make sure that it integrates for uh, well with our um, Apache Kafka offering. Uh, eventually, we will also support third-party Apache Kafkas, uh, but uh, initially, we'll definitely uh, make it work well with our own. Of course, uh, when you are starting to use an Ivan service, uh, as for with any Ivan service, uh, we will support multiple different kinds of metrics integrations uh, from uh, you being able to export metrics from the service uh, over Prometheus, or and if you're uh, a Datadog user, you can definitely get to use that as well. Currently, uh, we're tentatively planning the release for late Q3 of this year, so uh, roughly uh, uh, one quarter ahead from now. Okay, uh, that was it for uh, the first one, which was ClickHouse. Um, the next one is um, time series, the horizontally scalable time series, and why do we need it? So with the advent of Kubernetes, uh, basically there have been many, many more uh, containers where to collect metrics from. So uh, historically, if you had, let's say, one large big box and you collected metrics from that, now that bo uh, one single big large box has actually, actually been segmented into hundreds or thousands of containers where you actually want individual metrics for out from each of them. Uh, also, IoT use cases are something our customers uh, tell that they actually are collecting tons of time series data on. So it's also something that was close to our heart when we were starting to think about this. Uh, one of the other requirements we had around this was that actually we would like the data store to be able to horizontally scale. So uh, to actually not have any uh, practical near-term limits, so you could actually scale this to potentially to uh, very large clusters as well. It also should come with out-of-the-box high availability, as in uh, the clusters themselves should be highly available. While our systems will um, do their usual self-healing tricks as well, uh, it's still a good idea for the clusters to be uh, highly available out of the box as well. Of course, uh, the, one of the other requirements is uh, if they, and the system really needs to support uh, good compression ratios for time series data, as in uh, you can gain huge compression benefits from uh, more than 10 to 1 benefits from uh, having it compressed data well. Also, um, we were looking for something that you could actually run in multiple clusters that are connected to each other. So because Ivan as a company is running uh, services around the globe, it would really be nice to actually support uh, something that actually scales globally as well. Uh, then uh, why we really care about uh, having something that actually uh, scales that well is that in the last year, uh, our customer uh, node counts actually grew 5x. Um, so meaning the uh, data volumes that we're getting uh, from our metrics uh, in the monitoring sense uh, have basically more than grown than fivefold in the last year because we are also collecting much more data than we have ever before. Uh, it's something that we personally also needed in order for us to scale our business. Uh, the other thing that we are actually targeting this, because we're actually switching all of our um, own internal time series databases to work on M3 in the future, is that we will also be able to offer much richer, more detailed views on the data that we're actually already collecting from the service to our customers as well. And uh, our, from our current portfolio, uh, we're currently offering Influx uh, DB, but unfortunately, the open source version has uh, scaling limitations, as in uh, it cannot grow beyond a single node. And however large uh, node uh, you're using, you would basically need some sort of sharding outside the service itself uh, in order to be able to scale. So this is something we're looking to actually have uh, scaling and clustering as a built-in feature. Uh, enter AVEN for M3. Uh, so M3 is a horizontally scalable, highly available time series database that originated from Uber. So Uber is using this globally uh, at a vast scale. It's basically uh, uh, has been uh, used by them uh, for multiple years. There are multiple good presentations uh, from uh, former Uber engineers and uh, current Uber engineers on how they've been scaling the platform. 
but basically they've been able to uh, uh, scale uh, up to the needs that Uber has, which are fairly vast. Also, uh, it offers uh, fairly good compression ratios for time series data, as in it uses a variant of uh, Gorilla compression that I mentioned earlier on the ClickHouse side. So it achieves fairly good uh, compression ratios for time series data. Also, uh, it actually supports out of the box uh, geographically distributed operations. So let's say you have clusters in multiple different countries, you can actually fetch data from all of them and actually uh, gather data from all of them or replicate data even between them. Then, uh, of course, uh, net, uh, things that you typically expect from a time series database, as in uh, changing data resolution. So let's say you're collecting a data point every 30 seconds. You can actually aggregate uh, the data at the uh, less uh, accurate ratio. So let's say you only you know, want to have one data point every 10 minutes. Uh, M3 also supports this sort of uh, operating mode out of the box. And uh, as in the case of Kafka, where we um, manage also uh, the required Zookeeper services and hide them from the users, uh, uh, M3 actually internally also use ETCD, uh, which we're also going to have uh, as a um, managed offering within our M3 offering. It won't really be visible to the users, but they basically we will be taking care of another consensus service internally as well. Also, um, uh, I'd like to stress this. Uh, this will also actually provide uh, Ivan itself uh, like unlimited metrics uh, for us. So basically, we are looking at expanding heavily our uh, uh, different metrics that we provide out of our services, and M3 will give us a nice uh, handle on those. Uh, how we're going to be originally offering it is from three nodes and up. Uh, basically, we will again support the no downtime scaling according to customers' data needs. We will again have automatic backups that we support. Uh, but one of the nice things actually out of M3 is that it actually supports multiple different ingestion protocols uh, like Graphite or Prometheus. And we have recently actually contributed upstream our support for InfluxDB line protocol. So you can actually switch your pre-existing InfluxDB clients over uh, and basically they will just keep on working as if uh, you were operating against an Influx uh, database. Of course, uh, as our regular services, it will also integrate well with Grafana and we will come up with a ready-made da dashboards for actually you tracking M3 performance itself. Uh, for availability, we're actually looking to have uh, beta later this quarter and going GA in the next one. And then the final one, uh, and why we uh, care about this. Um, in data processing, uh, historically, people have, when they have done uh, data processing, they have often had to do things like ETL, as in they have extracted the data once a day, done a, a vast job of it, and analyzed it one way or another. But typically these days, companies are actually looking to have way more uh, closer to real-time performance on their uh, streaming analytics. So that sort of a mo model of operating is basically being left in the background uh, for many different use cases. Of course, um, since we also provide Apache Kafka as a service, uh, it's uh, something uh, a lot of our customers are already doing in some way or form, as in they already are uh, pushing through uh, Apache Kafka tons of data, and then they're processing them somehow. Uh, it's something that, of course, uh, we will now, with Flink, be able to offer as, uh, over SQL. So you'll actually be able to run SQL queries against uh, your Kafka streams, or actually uh, almost any of our Ivan services uh, can be used as sources or destinations for your data. And you can run a SQL over all of them. Uh, currently, uh, there are multiple different uh, other vendors also supporting SQL over streaming data. There's Apache Beam Project, there's uh, Apache Spark that has something similar. And of course, uh, Confluence KSQL also supports something. So it's looking like uh, SQL uh, might actually become the lingua franca of the stream processing world in the future as well. Of course, uh, Flink uh, being Flink, it actually also offers uh, batch uh, um, and streaming uh, jobs as well. Uh, so it's also uh, um, brings both uh, batching and real-time streaming use cases together. Uh, 
Then uh, what Apache Flink actually is, it allows basically doing stateful computations over data streams. So you can actually define uh, data streams that you'd like to be processed and then run arbitrary uh, processing on them. Initially, what we are going to be focusing on is uh, the SQL uh, side of things, as in you will be able to run SQL and create tables uh, as like Kafka topics, for example, and then have, let's say, an output table, which is, uh, uh, let's say, an Elasticsearch service. Uh, so you will be able to easily integrate multiple different services from us or between Ivan services and third parties. Also, uh, slightly later on, we will also allow you to run uh, custom code that is written in Java or Python, uh, basically natively against the data streams in question. Uh, as mentioned, uh, Apache Flink supports an incredible variety of data sources and destinations. Um, well, it supports the usual object storage ones, as in Amazon's S3, Google's Cloud Storage, and Azure Storage. So you can actually uh, both uh, ingest and output data into object stores for cheaper uh, uh, storing. Also, you can actually read data or write data to Apache Kafka, uh, AWS's Kinesis, or Google's PubSub, or even Apache Pulsar. Also, um, it uh, has support for a variety of different uh, relational databases. The ones from our portfolio, for example, like Postgres and MySQL, are bo have both uh, fairly uh, mature support. Also, uh, if you actually want, let's say, Cassandra to be the uh, uh, place where you end up storing the processed uh, data output, you can, of course, uh, send the data uh, from uh, Flink to uh, Cassandra as well. Uh, the idea behind all this is that it will tie many different uh, data services that we or third parties provide into a one co coherent data pipeline, as in, uh, instead of you having to write glue code that actually reads data from, let's say, Apache Kafka and then sends it onwards to another system, let's say Postgres, you can actually do uh, many of those things directly from Apache Flink as well. And of course, uh, like all our regular services, uh, it will come with ready-made metrics integration uh, with Datadog and Prometheus and others as well. Uh, initially, we'll be offering it starting from three node clusters, and we will again allow easy scaling uh, based on customer needs to um, uh, massively uh, large clusters as well. And initially, we're targeting uh, SQL support for it, and that will be basically where we'll be uh, focusing initially on. And of course, uh, the idea is, again, that you'll be able to create your own data pipelines uh, combining multiple different data sources and destinations from here. Uh, currently, we are targeting a beta in uh, late Q3 and a GA uh, release in Q4 of this year. Uh, without further ado, uh, I open the floor to questions. Do we have any questions at this point? Chris? We do indeed. Yes. Um, hang on okay. a second. Let me just load them up. Um, some people asked about slides. So I've just posted a link to the slides in the chat. Um, so that should be available for the next day. Um, Okay, so one question about um, ClickHouse was uh, how does it compare to Timescale DB? Uh, so they have a slightly different uh, use cases, Timescale DB being oriented around time series database uh, running as a Postgres extension, as in it allows you to do your regular uh, Postgres uh, things on time series data. ClickHouse is actually more oriented towards uh, it's a columnar oriented database, so it actually offers slightly superior uh, compression ratios, uh, but it's basically uh, meant for analytics use cases, as in, uh, like unlike Timescale, for example, which allows you to uh, modify your data, uh, ClickHouse makes it very difficult for you to actually modify data. So it's basically made for uh, data warehousing queries where you analyze data, let's say, uh, uh, like the proverbial example of this is uh, running calculations on if you're a bookstore, how many books did I sell at the end of each day, for example. Uh, but again, it's mostly uh, that um, 
ClickHouse has some support for time series data, but it's not a full blown OLTP system like Postgres plus timescale. So they have a slightly different use cases. Okay, thanks. Um, so another question then was, what's the key advantage of M3 over ClickHouse for time series data? Uh, it's basically only focusing on that. So uh, the uh, scale at which uh, Uber has been using it for purely time series data is to truly staggering. Uh, while you can do ClickHouse, uh, things with ClickHouse around that, it, uh, things like uh, changing aggregations and uh, resolutions of your data aren't that uh, simple. You can do them, but it's uh, basically meant for a slightly different use case. So while they overlap slightly, uh, M3 is clearly shines in the department when you actually want time series data to be handled. Okay. Are there any other questions from any participants now? Uh, feel free to unmute yourself also. Uh, here we go. So how are permissions for running streaming applications in Flink handled in the Ivan offering? Can every developer create and operate their own applications, or is there an ops team that has to do it? Uh, can you actually repeat the beginning of the thing, or actually the whole thing? Because I could. Yeah. So, how are permissions for running streaming applications in Flink handled in the Ivan offering? So, I guess this is about uploading custom code and things like this. Um, so, we will be basically uh, uh, like not in the very first beta, uh, but we will shortly thereafter. We will be um, running all this in sandboxes where the customers will be able to upload their. Uh, own Java jars or uh, Python uh, application code uh, that will be run on the, on the cluster itself in a safe, secure sandbox that will uh, allow you to do that. Uh, hopefully that answered the question. I'm not sure I uh, got the whole gist of it. Okay. Um, Julian, if it doesn't answer, feel free to mention in the chat. Um, another question. Can you also hear me? Uh, yes, I can, yeah. yeah. Hello. Go ahead. Cool. Um, so another question was, uh, yeah, the sandbox, is it handled by a dedicated team? Uh, well, uh, well, I'm not quite sure what the, uh, like, uh, how do we internally develop uh, uh, stuff around that or how do you, uh, as the user, uh, take advantage of it? It's basically will be transparent to the users, as in the code will just be run in those and uh, the user uh, can basically just expect that they will be able to run their own code eventually. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, David mentions, uh, could you touch on multi-region support for each of the offerings? Uh, multi-region uh, for uh, uh, like uh, ClickHouse will probably, uh, at least uh, for this year, uh, remain within a single region. Of course, like uh, like all of our offerings, they are all multi-AZ uh, out of the box. Uh, but we are probably not planning this year to actually have uh, multi-region support for ClickHouse. It's something we'll probably take a look uh, l next year at some point, but no deadlines or schedules for that yet. Uh, for M3, uh, there's... Um, multiple kinds of uh, multi-region support we can add, uh, but right now we haven't finalized those details on exactly which option we're gonna go with uh, initially. Okay, thanks. Um, one other question is where to find good documentation connecting Kafka with Flink. Uh, I guess we can share or possibly tweet some uh, uh we can probably like uh, uh flink uh, um uh, like flink uh, itself has some fairly okay documentation uh they uh on the 1.10 uh release around they actually uh, uh, refreshed quite a bit of the documentation around that but uh if you can drop your email or something we can definitely uh try to send you some uh, links yep and there's the links from the 1.10 um link um for connecting with Kafka also. Um, Sudeshan mentions, does the planned Flink uh, SQL service provide a, um, 
for sourcing and syncing data? Can it access services outside of Ivan, like first party cloud services? Uh, yes, that's the idea. Like uh, whether they will all be supported in the initial release, uh, probably not, but they are definitely uh, something that we're looking for. If there's something that you'd like us to uh, consider prioritizing higher than others, uh, please let us know and uh, we'll take a look. Yeah, so to add to that, the easiest way to let us know is to use the intercom chat on our website, but you can also um, email us as well. Uh, sales or support at is uh, it's good enough. Or Twitter, I guess, is also an option. Yeah, probably uh, out of those, I heavily recommend the intercom one. It will definitely uh, go uh, straight to the team. So, uh, yeah. Um, which version of Flink and will there be, uh, and what versions of the JVM will we support? Uh, that's actually a good one. So, uh, uh, currently, um, uh, the release timing will probably coincide with 1.11. Probably not 1.12. Uh, the JVM 11 support is currently uh, still not in any released version of Link. So uh, currently, if we were to go out today, it would be JVM 8. But by the time we go out, I'm hoping it will be JVM 11 uh, plus. Any other questions? Nothing else is coming in so far. Um... So here's another one. So if I'm running a Kafka cluster within Ivan now, what benefits does uh, using something like Flink offer me in my data pipeline? Uh, so typically when you're uh, running, let's say your Kafka cluster in Ivan, uh, you have something that consumes data and then does some sort of transformation or something on it and then writes the data out possibly somewhere else. Uh, so what Flink actually allows you to do is without uh, creating glue code, you can actually uh, do the transformations on Flink already. Uh, of course, uh, let, let's say um, you're currently using uh, something like Kafka Connect, uh, you will still be able to use that in the future, uh, but uh, like um, Flink has a fairly extensive set of uh, like um, sources and targets that where it can read or write from, um, so you'll be able to benefit from those as well. Okay, so kind of adding extra computational capabilities? Yeah, basically processing capabilities, as in historically we've supported um, um, uh, like Apache Kafka, so you've actually been able to do transport of the data, but now you'll also be able to uh, process and transform the data and send it on its way to uh, wherever you need it the next. Nice, thanks. There are okay. no other questions that have come in. Um, if you do think of something afterwards, then of course, as Hanu mentioned, there is uh, intercom and other social channels and email as well. Um, yeah, we hope this has been useful and thanks for joining us. I think one of the biggest reasons I joined Ivan is the focus on open source and uh, because of the open source offerings we have, we do utilize the community around them. It's, it's, it's one of the bigger parts, right? So we recognize being part of the community involves giving back as much as we gain, which is something we do do a lot through GitHub, uh, which you can see on github.com slash Ivan, um, maintaining and contributing to other projects. We're not just users of open source, but we are contributors and maintainers. But a lot of people here probably know it's not just about code, right, when it comes to managing communities, especially large open source communities split around the globe. So we've kind of started this webinar series as a way of providing a bit more back to the community in the non-development focused areas. This is a demo trial experiment, I guess, on our side. So uh, when there are topics you'd like covered, people within the Ivan team you'd like to speak to, engineering, ops, design, marketing, sales, all of those things, then uh, let us know. You can email webinars at ivan.io as well, or email directly chrisg at ivan.io if you want, Twitter, again, all of these options. So for those of you that are here that are using our services, thanks. For those of you that are considering using our services, hopefully this helped 
sway you in the positive direction. And uh, yeah, this is a cool platform for us to be able to share a bit more about how we work, what we offer, the benefits of what we offer, um, and how they can integrate with um, services, tools, and processes that, that you're working with. So yeah, thanks everyone for joining and keep an eye out for the next announcement for the next webinar. And again, if you have topic ideas, send them to us. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks to Hanu.